You are listening to Supplement Source, the official podcast of the Council for Responsible Nutrition. And now, your host, Jeff Ventura. Hello, and welcome to the latest episode of Supplement Source. I'm Jeff Ventura, the Vice President of Communications here at the Council for Responsible Nutrition. I am so excited to have with us today Dr. Alyssa Dweck, who's the Chief Medical Officer for Bonafide Health. Dr. Dweck, thank you so much for joining. It is absolutely my pleasure to be here. Thank you, Jeff. I, you know, I think the timing of you coming on uh, is just absolutely um, perfect because we have been noticing uh, in the media a lot of articles that I would assume maybe are confusing, certainly consumers, but also I think members of our industry, there's a lot of critical critical things being written about menopause and supplements. I wanted to really kind of tackle that head on. Uh, and I know you've got quite a story to tell uh, in this area. So can we just talk for a moment about kind of break through some of the confusion and kind of get at the issue? Absolutely. So first of all, by way of background, I am a practicing gynecologist, seeing patients of all ages for many, many years already. But as we always say in gynecology, our patients tend to age with us. So naturally, many of my patients are traversing the menopause transition right now, or in menopause, the difference being the transition are those four to eight or 10 years before menopause actually occurs, but when hormone changes are really variable and symptoms can occur that are distressing. And menopause, defined as 12 consecutive months without menstruation after the age of 40. So naturally, many of the women that I see on a day-to-day are in this category. And you are so right, Jeff, Menopause, as they say, is truly having a moment because for so many years, this subject matter was really considered an absolute taboo for women to talk about. Nobody wanted to call attention to uh, the symptoms of menopause. They didn't want to be labeled as quote unquote old or losing their fertility or femininity, which really is a social construct, of course. But, you know, the long and the short of it is women are having symptoms during this time, this very natural time in their lives, and these symptoms can be uncomfortable. And we need answers uh, for these um, patients and consumers who perhaps don't necessarily want to only take hormones. And it's interesting. I, I was speaking to our, our, our chief science officer here uh, about uh, this particular interview, and she said something that struck me about how uh, menopause used to be associated you know, with hot flashes. Like, that was it. You know, and, <laughs> na- and now it really, you know, th- there's an understanding coming into focus that it really affects Uh, so many different aspects of a woman's life. You are very correct. I, in fact, you would not have enough time on this podcast for me to list the multiple symptoms that can be associated with perimenopause and menopause because there are so many. But for sure, hot flashes and night sweats, which we refer to as vasomotor symptoms collectively, are kind of the iconic symptom of menopause. So obviously, this is something that we speak about all the time. The other symptom that is still a little bit taboo, but absolutely getting more attention would have to do with the changes that occur in the intimate skin like vaginal dryness and discomfort during uh, intimacy. So these are these are two things that I am faced with in practice uh, day in and day out. And talk to me a little bit about um, the perception that women themselves have about menopause. I was reading that you that you conducted a survey uh, about the attitudinal, um, sort of uh, perspectives of of women around menopause and what their understanding is of it. What, can you give me a little bit about that? Absolutely. So, bona fide health, which really we've dedicated ourselves to women's health in general, but we really do focus in the menopause population in regard to symptom relief. We conduct a survey yearly. This is, I think, our third or fourth one. And what we have found is that uh, this year is that women are still really thirsty for knowledge 
regarding menopause and the symptoms that are related. So they're really, really yearning for information and accurate information uh, in an effort to really help uh, with their comfort and their relief and so that they can remain productive and comfortable and optimistic about their, uh, about their uh, life stage. So I think that was a big learning that was noted. Uh, I think that the statistic that really shocked me is that seven out of 10 women in the survey still didn't really understand the formal definition of menopause. So we do still have quite a bit of work to do to really educate uh, the masses in this field. I actually worked a million years ago at Brigham and Women's Hospital, and one of my uh, doctors that I interacted with was Joanne Manson. And I remember the HRT stuff. And Mm -hmm. uh, I can remember, you know, it seems to me like you know, when people think of menopause or when women think of menopause and they think of, you know, sort of uh, solutions or interventions, their minds immediately go to hormone, you know, yeah. replacement therapy. Um, of course. Um, but, but talk about supplements because, uh, and did your survey ask them uh, what their awareness level was around supplements intended to, to help them through the process? Well, we surely depicted an openness to learning about supplements because face it the landscape in menopause care really took a a nosedive about 20 years ago when a very famous study called the WHI uh, was halted early and this was a study to look at the effects of hormone replacement therapy on cardiovascular health and the study was halted early due to an increased risk of breast cancer that was noted in one arm of the study I think that's when I was gonna, I was at the Brigham then. Yes, that was when it, yeah yes, yeah really changed the landscape of things and the uh, amount and number of hormone uh, prescriptions really plummeted and really has not fully recovered by any means, even in 20 years since that information has been reevaluated and that risk of breast cancer really is not what originally was stated. With that said, because I don't want to get into too uh, much of the weeds with that study, women for so long now have been looking for alternatives to hormone therapy for various reasons. Number one, people are scared of breast cancer still, and we're doing our best to educate people that perhaps that risk is not as high as originally thought. Number two, there are a a really fair number of women who can't take hormone therapy, whether they have a history of breast cancer or perhaps a blood clotting disorder or other medical issues that would make hormone therapy more more risk than uh, benefit. Enter the supplement world. Uh, You know, we at Bonafide have actually literally just uh, launched a new product that is meant for hot flashes and night sweats due to low estrogen of menopause. It's called Thermella, and we actually formulated this with the uh, really great work on our R&D team by trying to follow a mechanism of action well-known and well-studied in the pharmacologic world. And this involves receptors called NKB receptors, and our product uh, works on these receptors similar to a new drug that had come out about two years ago. We really pride ourselves in trying to uh, do clinical research and uh, use scientific principle to show safety and efficacy in supplements so that women who can't or don't want to take hormones or other drugs for that matter can feel comfortable that these things have been vetted properly and they're taking something safe. Let's talk about the, the comfort level of, um, of healthcare practitioners when yeah. it comes to uh, supplements uh, for menopause. Is there some convincing to do there as well? Most definitely. And I'm really glad you asked this because this is the exact reason that I got so involved with Bonafide Health as a traditionally trained physician, because I do have a background in nutrition from before medical school. And thank goodness for that, because sadly, both medical school and residency training really do not provide much education about nutrition or supplements. I mean, maybe we get 
a couple of hours on vitamins and cellular processes, but that's really not enough. And we never really see clinical application in the real world when it comes to supplements. Lack of education, lack of knowledge tends to lead to a little bit of distrust. And I have absolutely seen a little bit more compromise over the past few years with traditionally trained physicians really starting to learn a little bit more about the supplement world and feeling a bit more comfortable. Uh, after all, consumers are demanding that their doctors know about this because they want to potentially engage and they want their doctor's approval. Well, and we know that that approval, I mean, certainly exists in the prenatal space. Um, so why, you know, why can't one, you know, <laughs> op yeah. open one's <laughs> mind to the notion that uh, perhaps there's some benefit in the menopausal space as well? Without question. The other thing is that look, women have been traditionally kind of underrepresented in many clinical studies, whether it regards menopause or other just general health. Uh, because after all, women are not just little men. It, you know, we really do have nuances in our uh, biologic processes, if you will. So I think this really brings to light how much more research uh, is needed. And I, I feel really happy that we are researching supplements in the menopause space. What are we not talking about? I, you know, I, I, I often ask people that um, because I, I feel like there's, there's always something going on behind the scenes when you go to a conference and you're talking to other doctors or you're in this, you're, you're in this, this space. Um, what, you know, is it, it could be, you know, innovation. It could be uh, something where you're reading uh, a, a media report that really, you know, steams you because they're getting information. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's certainly we've seen those here where we, you know, where our jaws are, you know, are on the floor because we can't believe some of the misinformation that gets put out there. Um, is there something, is there something uh, that you'd like to share that, you know, you think uh, is worth sharing around, uh, around this issue? Well, what I really think we're missing is that the biggest and most um, acceptable alternative for people, let's just say for women with hot flashes and night sweats right now, is doing nothing. That's the biggest competition for not only supplements, but also pharmacologic agents and hormone replacement. People choose to do nothing. They feel like they need to quote unquote, suck it up and just deal with it until uh, it, it naturally passes. And that's really not acceptable. So I, I think that's something that really comes to mind with something that's not spoken about. Um, does that make sense? Absolutely. I mean, and you know, um, clearly, if, if they're you know, if there are some remedies to a lot of the, the, the host, I mean, it's really a, you know, a panoply of symptoms that, that, that women can experience. If there's some remedy to, to some of these uh, symptoms uh, in the form of a supplement, I mean, we know when we, when we do the consumer survey that we, we do every year, um, the confidence level that the consumer has in supplements is actually quite high. Um, sure. And um, so, you know, any kind of awareness, uh, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's the consumer isn't as, I guess what it, it's to say that the consumer may not be as um, reticent about taking supplements as say the healthcare practitioner is in, in recommending them. Um, and so uh, any awareness around uh, what they can do uh, for menopause uh, is certainly, I think, you know, good information for the consumer and their decision process. Absolutely. And to your point, I think when you think about healthcare providers, specifically physicians who are traditionally trained, they want to know that a supplement or a device that's not pharmacologic, if you will, works as well as and as safely as what's available in the drug world. So for example, we have a product called Reverie made a uh, predominantly of hyaluronic acid. We also have an extra strength variety, but for the sake of uh, this question, we actually went to the trouble of doing a randomized uh, controlled study comparing the standard of care for vaginal dryness, which is estrogen cream, 
and our device, Reverie, which is just hyaluronic acid. And we didn't do the study. We had it run at a uh, prestigious institution, NYU. And we were thrilled, as were so many other healthcare providers thrilled to find that both really performed equally to each other. Mm -hmm. And to your point, this really gives providers trust to be able to recommend something that's a little bit off the beaten path from what they were trained to recommend for vaginal dryness, let's say. Um, And I think that's where all supplements can really find a place if perhaps they can be shown to be as good as or almost as good as or do a, a fine job at controlling similar symptoms than a pharmacologic agent can and do it safely. Well, and I mean, obviously our tagline is the science behind the supplement. So we certainly would agree with that. And, you know, when you look at a lot of these companies uh, who are, you know, these supplement companies who are investing, uh, you know, R&D dollars into that kind of you know, scientific proof um, uh, so that, you know, healthcare practitioners, to your point, uh, can feel, you know, can feel like they can make a confident uh, recommendation. Um, yeah. Certainly, that's uh, something that that <laughs> we're seeing, and we're we're happy to see it. Um, to Absolutely, be, to be honest, yeah, yeah. Um, well, listen, I, you've cleared up so much for us. Um, is there something that that we're missing that we're not talking about uh, that you want to tell folks, uh, particularly in the supplement industry? We really hold ourselves to ourselves to a really high standard. Yeah. We really take the time to do significant studies. We start with in vitro studies. We move on to preclinical studies. We do open label studies. And if everything is all the stars are aligned and things look good, we then move on to RCTs, which is of course the gold standard. And that's what most healthcare practitioners are going to look at, listen to, and feel trusted. So I just absolutely love that algorithm that we follow. It gives me a lot of faith as somebody who wants to be true to my field. So. Sounds like that's that puts the B in bonafide for sure. <laughs> I would say so. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Alyssa Dweck, thank you so much for joining us today. We really do appreciate all of your insights. You bet. Thank you.